And we're, I think we're live. There we go. Cool. All right. Well, uh, this is me. This is Jeremiah on Gerb the Humanist. And we've got uh, Christy Winters. Um, it, it's good to actually talk to you um, verbally. Like we've, we've chatted online quite a bit. We've been friends since I think MythCon. <laughs> I wonder why that is. Okay. <laughs> but uh, it's it's nice to to meet you um, finally on air and finally talk to you. How are you doing? I'm doing well. And likewise, it's nice to actually interact um, on a more human level than just be limited to hundred to two hundred and eighty characters and any kind of witty gif that <laughs> can accentuate the emotion of the text. Um, that's fun too. But this is uh, nice and not nearly as hard on my thumbs. <laughs> that's that's good yeah i agree it's, it's good to uh it's good to good to make that human connection i think that's what we're doing today yeah and also we're both nerds and so you know, when you have to sort of seek out nerds to have nerdy conversations with sometimes because there are thoughts in your head and uh, it helps to get them out with someone else who can relate to your nerdiness absolutely yeah um <laughs> Yeah, sometimes I sometimes I need another person to make me make sense, and uh, you might do that today. Oh, very much so. Uh, actually, a friend of mine was struggling with the writing of her introduction to her thesis, and and actually the introduction to her introduction. <laughs> right? How was she going to start set it all up? Because she had so many ideas, and um, the point of an introduction in a thesis isn't to sort of introduce things. You're really giving an overview of the structure and the arguments. You're basically it's like a road plan to what the mm -hmm. reader is going to have to experience in the next few chapters. And I asked her, like, we just sat down, I had my phone, I got out the recording, voice recording app and sat it down, I'm like, okay, tell me about your thesis. Start at the beginning, like, mm -hmm. I don't know anything and tell me about it. And through that process of having to explain it, um, she actually got to a coherent structure that she used as the basis of her introduction. Mm -hmm. So yeah, talking things through to another person um, is a really useful tool to help you organize your own thoughts. Very mm -hmm. much. So have, you, have you heard of the rubber duck method in computer programming? No, no, no but this oh. sounds adorable. I oh hope, my God. It's, I hope no, it's as adorable as it sounds. It, it is because, um, because, because uh, what you just described was, you know, you had someone, somebody to explain that to you, uh, like explain your ideas and, and flesh them out. Um, but you don't even necessarily need, something giving you feedback you just like mm. try to explain it so so the rubber duck method is you put a rubber duck next to your computer and then you explain <laughs> you explain your code to the rubber duck and then um inevitably as you explain it you find whatever bug uh or or, or thing you you were missing ahead of time and and uh, you find it so. i now, I think that's actually, um, I have no doubt that that's the case. Because mm -hmm. again, when we think, we can have a lot of different thoughts that are interconnected and make sense to us in our heads. But when we have to explain it to somebody else, and that's the part of writing that is hard, it, we have to then put it into an order. And we have to think about the when we set certain concepts up and when we bring them back and what is the content that needs to be account, sort of set up and explained, the method or the data or whatever, in order for people to make sense of the results. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm completely convinced by the rubber duck. I might actually go and get a rubber duck now because I have some writing to do in the next few days. <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't even have to be a rubber duck. I think that's the, the paradigmatic uh, object of which to use. Yeah. No, I just... You know, a stuffed bear or something, you know? Well, we actually have a little um, water feature in the back of our building, and there are a bunch of ducks back there that float in the, not really a pond. But, so it'll kind of go along with the theme of the my workplace if I have a duck on my desk, on my computer. And also, and then I can make reference to the actual, yeah, the rubber duck thing um, when I explain why I have a rubber duck sitting on my computer monitor <laughs> sounds good so so um what i wanted to uh i think what we decided to talk about was um a mishmash of of science scientism um humanizing science and 
for the past year or so, ever I, I was on an episode of Embrace the Void um, with um, with Aaron and GW, and and we talked about scientism. It, actually, it might have been. It, it was also right after MythCon. What a weird coincidence. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and um, I think I've just gotten on this bent about bashing scientism and and that's usually why, why don't why don't i give it why don't i give a definition i'll share screen or uh how do i yeah how do i so on the left side yeah if you go on the left side of your screen there should be a tab it's the green ah. uh, and white icon and then yeah. click a uh, share entire screen uh yes there we go oh there we go yeah. okay so i'm gonna and go to now I'm going to go to Wikipedia. I'm going to give a definition of scientism for the viewers slash listeners later. Um, and I liked these two points on the list, these two bullet points. And scientism can be the improper usage of science or scientific claims, um, just the first sentence. And then the other one is the belief that the methods of natural science or the categories and things recognized in natural science form the only proper elements of any philosophical or other inquiry. And so what I've been, like I've been on a little bit of a bent on bashing the latter for about a year because I, I think a feature of this dunking takedown culture, um, you know, toxic um, anti-SJWism is like the facts don't care about your feelings, um, stuff like that. Um, a complete lack of appreciation for social structures, social norms, um, any sort of humanity. And I think that's because those things don't necessarily fit in a scientific framework. Um, but you know, there's there's obviously other problems with scientism, and th people do overstate um, how capable science is in their in its capabilities. And I've just been really against it. And I want to hear your thoughts on this because I I feel like I'm a scientist, and I love science. And th there's a tension because this group of people that I'm bashing for scientism is in reality really small and it's often relegated to the internet or, you know, maybe some science communicators like Steven Pinker. While on the other hand, uh, I've got a whole uh, Southern United States that doesn't believe evolution is real. <laughs> you know, like there's a whole voting contingent in the United States um, and, and just doing this work, like a lot of the things that I say, um, criticizing scientism um, could easily be misconstrued and used as a tool um, to get, you know, say your fundy believers to say, see science, science isn't the truth or something. I, I don't know, I want, I, I, I'm wondering your thoughts on that because I feel like there's a balance and I'm pushing one way when the, the country needs me to push the other, almost. No, I think you're right. In some ways those are the um, Janus headed coin, you know, too much belief in science, too much faith in science, shall we say? And yes. then no faith, you know, no belief in science. And what I think we always perhaps kind of, I think is important to remember is that science is a process. You know, it's not a holy book and it's not a complete fraud. It's a knowledge production process. And so the way that I look at science, and I think people who do more, the more you do science, I think perhaps you get this view as well, is Bertrand Russell has this quote about being liberal is a lot like having a scientific viewpoint that your opinions are based on evidence, that they are held tentatively with the understanding that new information could always come in at any time that would overturn your previous worldview. Mm -hmm. And so you go with basically the best thing you can get your hands on until something better comes along. That I think is the middle way, the Buddhist middle way between these <laughs> two extremes, which is to recognize that, um, you know, much like Churchill said about democracy, it's, you know, the worst system 
worse thing except for everything else we've tried. Science isn't perfect, but it's pretty damn good and it's had some really good successes that can't be ignored. However, science argues there are debates within science. Uh, scientists, I should be saying, have debates within science. Technologies can routinely revolutionize our perception of the world 20 years ago, let alone 150 years ago. And that modesty that comes with uh, hum fallible beings trying to make certain claims, I think, is what gets lost in those those two extremes. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and I will say on the whole, um, my country does need a lot more faith in science. <laughs> like, I think that would be a better thing, but you know, and yeah, I think part of that is cultural. Really if you've got, right? yeah, I mean, schools can do so much, but you have an attitude, an anti-science attitude in the community or in parts of society, then that is going to, that, ha that can't just be fixed through public education or private education. Yeah. Yeah, I think and, and you know there is sort of this this revival, I guess, or I'm not sure if it's a revival, but um you know, it's the better angels of our nature, uh Steven Pinker, um enlightenment fetishizing, I, I fetishes the uh, Yeah. But like um fetishization yeah, fetishization. I think uh, there's a bit too much there. Maybe, maybe it's among the privileged, like that, uh, you know, once people get on board with reason and logic and, and, and scientific thinking, I talked about this with Matthew Fasciani last time, once people get on board when that, with that, then they'll realize how to make, you know, a, a more egalitarian society and i just don't think that's mm. the case like i don't think science can do that um i think there's a lot more to the story like people in power want to keep that power they want to maintain it and they want to uh aggregate more of it and um a better understanding of what's true and what's not isn't really a factor in that so i don't know no, I think you're right. My assumption, too, was that uh, moving into the atheist community, that they would have not only sort of rejected the supernatural claims and logical inconsistencies in the Bible and contradictions, but also completely questioned and rejected the patriarchy and sexism <laughs> and hierarchy, you know. And then I met, started meeting, you know, real new atheists. And, yeah, they weren't like that. <laughs> the good thing is... So those two things... Yeah. The good thing is, for the most part, when you meet them in real life, they're usually better. At least, may, maybe it's a selection thing too, because you know I've I've gone to events and uh, everybody's there is just great. So I don't know, just fantastic. But uh, I don't know. One time I I did. I, I was at an event and I was hanging out with my friends and 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 I really need to watch this thing. Like I I snarkily made the. Uh, oh, uh, I, I made the snarky like, oh, we're all Africans. We can all get along, I, which I, you know, I think is a, it, it's kind of a shallow, slightly racist sentiment. Um, and, and I was like, oh, other people might think I'm being an asshole. I should stop doing that. And then a few minutes later, a guy walks into the room wearing that shirt that we are all Africans. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> well, so, um, Cool. I think I think this that frames the discussion really well for for how I wanted to talk about it because I think science is definitely a lot more human than a lot of skeptics and scientismists um, mm -hmm. give appreciation for. Um, I, I'll just talk about my experiences a little bit. I, I think even within. Um, my graduate career um, in my in my uh, research group, I have a pretty robotic advisor. <laughs> um, he's you know um, he's been known to show an emotion on occasion, but he's uh, you know very hardworking and uh, very um, very methodical in his thinking. But at the same time, when when I've written a paper last year, and I'm going to be writing, I'm I'm in the process of writing a new one. Um, it's all about, you know, 
these are the results. I'm, I'm working with molecules and, and biophysics. So a very hard science, quote unquote. He's like, you know, you, you're, you, you've got these results and you've got these results and it's all in a jumble. And he's like, you need to tell a story. You need to, to put everything together in a coherent way that makes sense that the reader can walk through. And it, it really is storytelling, even though it's written in perhaps a dry, methodical, um, formal style that is for the journal. That is a sense in like we're, we are actually telling a story to other scientists. And I don't think outside of people who do science, there's enough appreciation for that, mm. that viewpoint. I'm not, I'm not sure what you think. I completely that. agree. No, I, I, I completely agree with that because, you know, I actually distinctly remember when I handed in my thesis, I had a draft of my abstract and um, or the draft of the introduction, and in the introduction, I say what the conclusions are at the end. And my supervisor said, you know, a thesis in a way, in a lot of ways, is like a book. It's kind of like a mystery book, except you don't have to wait till the end to figure out what happens. You actually put your answer, your conclusions at the start. And the mystery of the science isn't sort of the who, it's the how. How did you come to these conclusions? And that's the story you're telling. So you're mm -hmm. saying, here's this question. Here's the answer I've arrived at. Now I'm going to take you through the process of how I arrived at this answer. So it's in that way, it's more like maths courses where it doesn't matter if you get the answer right if you can't show your work. Because right. the interesting thing is happening in the middle bit <laughs> right there. And not, not all people who write scientific articles think like that. But I think articles that communicate well have that assumption of their underlying sort of core structure. Yeah. I'll have to I'll have to keep that in mind. Maybe that'll help me with my second manuscript. So that's good. Yeah. yeah. Yes, good stuff. And well, this is what kind of gets to the research that I kind of I pointed to when I ran the 2010 qualitative election study in the UK it was during the phenomenon of Clegmania. Mm -hmm. And there were bounces in the polls for this third party and wild speculation one person said oh maybe they could be the next biggest pay the overtake labor as the second party if labor does really poorly and then at the election they got basically the same amount of votes the percentage that they got in the previous election mm -hmm. and everyone's like what happened to clegmania and there were accounts that were written by experts and there were people who looked at geographical things about the marginality of the constituency and what i had done was to look at after uh, the told me about the story of their election day after I interviewed them post-election. The question I would ask is literally tell me the story of your election day. When did you decide to vote? Um, what did you do that day? How was your voting experience? You know, like, did you have to wait a long time in line? Did you wait up for the results? Tell me about you know, the whole day. And then I was joined by a, a, my current like co-investigator, Dr. Adzia Carvalho, who's wonderful. She joined the project afterwards. One of the pieces of research we looked at were those stories. And when we went to do the analysis for them, we have a couple of techniques in qualitative research when looking at text. One is open coding, which is you don't go with any preconditions or ideas in your head. You just read the text and you notice what the contents are. What are the themes? What are the words that come up? What are the values that are repeated? And you just make a note of those. And we had, in our case, 30 stories spread across England, Scotland, and Wales, people of different ages, different parties, different undecided, not or totally decided before the election. We put all that together and we came up with some themes. And so we went, okay. Uh, then we used another theme called, or another technique called discourse analysis, where you look at what the words are inside. What are the things that are actually being said in these themes that we found? How are, what phrases are people using? Or do we um, see repeated emotions over time? But even at that point, we felt like there was stuff in the data that we couldn't capture with either grounded theory method or with discourse analysis. And we went to narrative analysis, which is the study of how people tell stories. And that was the technique we used. We ended up just using a classic story arc of whatever seven points it was, sort of like with the, you set it up and then you have this, you know, building up of tension and then there's a turning point and then there's some sort of, you know, there might be conflict and resolution. And by using that, we were able to structure people's stories according to the way that they set up the narrative. And how people told the stories were very different, we found. 
we found that people who had already decided how they were going to vote oftentimes prefaced their story by saying, well, I knew I was going to vote labor going into this. Mm -hmm. And then the story would be about justifying their decisions and then the story of their day. People who were undecided would start the story with, well, I didn't know how I was going to vote. And then they would talk about the things that they were weighing up and uh, the thing that made up their mind. And then you know, what they did when they went to the polls. And some of the people went to the polls deciding to vote for the Liberal Democrats, but ended up marking either Labour or Conservative because they just, something happened. Like, they just couldn't bring themselves to vote for a different party because they had, these people had both been, um, actually three of them, longtime members of that party. So this would be changing and voting for a new party. And in the end, they couldn't do it. Uh, one Labour and two Conservative people told basically the same stories. And so we found this psychological component that can't be measured if you do experimental work, like would you vote for candidate A or candidate B? And it can't be done in the surveys correctly because um, you know, these people actually got up on the election day. If you had polled them that morning, they would have told you they were voting for liberal Democrats. But if mm -hmm. you've asked them when they came out, they would have voted for the party they've always part voted for. So we could only really get at this phenomenon by listening to people tell us their experiences. And what we identified was there's this extra psychological burden of almost cognitive dissidence. If you've th thought of yourself as labor your whole life, it mm -hmm. takes quite it took it takes a bit to change your identity and vote for a new party. And a more comfortable thing to do for people is to find a rationale to do what they've always done. Mm -hmm. And so and, and so we found that through the structures of the story. That was how we found that data. And when I came to write it up, I actually used the elements of the story structure we used to analyze the data as my headings in my article. So I structured the article in the structure of a story about us analyzing stories. Hmm. Yeah, I, I thought I, that was kind of cool. No, that, that is really interesting. I'm trying to think of a way you could circumvent that. And the, the only way I could think of doing it is, is completely, uh, I, I imagine completely untenable and potentially would change the results would be to like poll those people that morning and then right after they voted. And <laughs> like, I think that would just be really difficult to uh, implement as a, as a, as a polling technique and and not to mention once once people write down that that morning that i'm going to vote for this group um mm -hmm. there, either there's no guarantee yeah. they either either they've already made that swap like what you've described if, if that makes sense right. like they've they've flipped because they decided you know now that i have to put it down on paper i i have to vote labor or um or they've uh self-identified um or or they've self-identified as a, a liberal democrat voter and uh and change and that changes deterministically what they were going to do anyway in the first place yeah, i think i think experimentally it would be almost a contaminant to ask people to tell you how they're going to vote before and after they, if you, they know they have to do it, right? Because you have to do it in the morning before they do it. And now they're doing something that nobody else who votes does, which is having to tell somebody. Um, so the experiment itself would be, um, I think, probably questioned on grounds of contamination that you're not really measuring what normal people do because you're putting somebody in an abnormal situation. But anyway, that's just, yeah. Yeah. Research well, that's, design that's, yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that's just, uh, you know, a STEM major giving my input on, on that sort of experimental design. I do not. I think what you could do then is, um, if you get people to diary, so panels, if you have, you have people on panels, they're just, I mean, they're, the panels are selected to be representative, but only a fraction of people will consider switching parties because, they're in a swing seat, you know, or for a protest reason. Most people vote the same party they've always voted for. Um, so to get enough of, but um, yeah, you, what you do, I would think, is you get people to diary their elections and then have them, you know, to ask to do two diary entries. So, but it, yeah, so there, there would be methodological ways of obtaining the data that you seek that would be less sort of of an impact on um, the experiment, you know, design, so. Mm -hmm. Sorry, this is getting really super nerdy. No, we can get back to, but no, this is, uh, sorry, but the story about narratives is that, <laughs> yeah, we have to communicate in stories because that's what humans naturally do. And it's what we naturally find interesting in terms of um, hearing a long piece of information. Yeah, because 
you know, you know, uh, the data that you get in chronological in the order oh. in the paper, like that would just be uh, foolhardy and confusing to your readers. Um, but but also, I'd, I'd like to put in at least um, my experience with science. Um, and, and I think a lot of people's experience with science, at least when maybe not working with whole data like you're working with or, or uh, you know, like psychology, um, like filling out forms or doing experiments. Like um, I, I know from talking to psychology students, like you, you have a bunch of money to implement this one study with a ton of humans and what you get is what you get. But um, for me, uh, I'm a little more flexible because I can do an experiment one day, I can do an experiment another day and, and tweak the conditions a little bit. And there, there, there's this idea of a one scientific method that, that you're taught in like elementary school. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you make a hypothesis, um, you think about how to create an experiment, you do an experiment, you analyze the results, and then you get to a conclusion or so, something like that. And that's just not how like experimental science works in my experience. Um, you, you like a lot of the time I'll go in looking for one thing and uh, you know, I, I don't find anything interesting, but then I accidentally like tweak one parameter and I find some interesting phenomena. So, so it'll be something like me, like, oh, I'm trying to change the temperature to, to, to get the energy of DNA melting. And with my, my sort of, the type of technique I use, that's really hard to find out. But then I find out that once I change the salt conditions, that something that I don't expect is occurring within my uh, experimental results. So then I just start varying the salt and, and that's really interesting. And then I can tie that back into how I end up writing about those results, you know, if, if that makes sense, you know. Part of the problem with how we write science is that we don't allow for those discussions to happen in the article. Like that whole mm -hmm. thing I told you about the fact that we did these two methods of analysis and we felt like there was still a method that there was still information that needed to be organized and we needed a new method. That None of that made it into the article. Mm -hmm. It just started with, here's narrative analysis, here's grounded theory and discourse analysis, as if we knew what we were doing from the beginning. But the fact is we found our way through there by working with the data. And so it looks a very neat process because you're limited to 6,000 or 9,000 words. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you have to get everything out in these publications. And you end up making it look like you always, you know, were you were Fonzie the whole time you were doing it. Hey, everything just went your way. Yep. And that's usually not how it goes. Right. That might lead to some uh, stress on certain graduate students' parts. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I think I think actually that might have been, you know, being more open about the process. That that has been sort of a proposal for. Um, better peer review and preventing p hacking like once researchers um like if if more researchers are open to watching you um set up and design and perform your experiments from the beginning in sort of like a meta peer review sense like people are watching you from the beginning um then they can see how that process works and and be able to critique the entirety of your methodology rather than just what's on paper so i think maybe maybe that would be interesting because that that does get more to the heart of of the scientific process as it actually manifests though though good luck getting academia to, to change anytime soon <laughs> So. Yeah, because um, unless it's citable, right, it's about the metrics of what is considered valuable of what you produce and, you know, honest renditions of your own research uh, mistakes and experiments and learning doesn't really get cited very often, right? So right. It's, a, it's a lot of work for basically no reward, even if it does good for the community, which is unfortunate. Yeah, there there's a lot of problems with that. And, and, and I know... I know like social sciences are there there's talk of a giant 
um, replication crisis. But you know, oh, yeah. Can I debunk that? Really? Oh, please go go ahead. All right. All right. So this comes out of a, a study. A bunch of researchers decided they wanted to see if they could replicate psychological studies. And there was a big problem with the way that they actually set up their study of studies in that um, they like uh, grabbed certain RM journals from disciplines, not a random selection. They had people pick the studies they wanted to replicate. They didn't randomly ass assign them. And then there's just some parallel problems. Like one study about perception of guns in high schools was conducted in California and the replication study was conducted in Denmark. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that they did collect on the study, although they didn't report, was they once they had the teams in place to replicate the original study, they would contact the original study team members and ask them, do you think this is a good replication of your study? And they rated from, you know, yes, this is a good one, or no, I don't think this is a good one. So they came out with this paper that said that what, like 30% of the findings could be replicated. And then there was a different piece from King, another guy who I interviewed, and that video is on my channel, one of the authors of the study. I was at APSA, the American Political Science Association, and I saw him on the list of people presenting papers and I asked to interview him. He said, yes. And their critique was when you, um, one, the methodology wasn't was inadequate and it, it should have been done by random selection, not the way that they did it. The other problem was that they didn't report um, that studies, the studies that replicated best at the highest rates were the ones where the original study team said, yes, this is a good replication. And the ones that performed poorly were the ones when the original study team said, no, this isn't a good one. So there were real deeper problems in that, so in that, study and the critique of it and then the people who did the original study answered the critique and it was a whole back and forth but um it's it's not the case that there's a replication um, problem in psychology right and that's where they studied it was in psychology um, and the social sciences you know um we've had uh you know mixed performance in the recent history on predicting election outcomes but generally we're within the margin of error which is what um, the last election if you look at the polling the poll mapped up to the national vote totals perfectly. What they missed was the electoral college because it redistributes the votes. Uh, so no, and we can we can predict events and we can replicate findings using the same data. Um, and but it's very convenient for certain people to cite a headline in a newspaper that's an even more dumbed down version, you know, of the original article right. and completely leaves out the critique. Oh yeah, that 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 leaves so many things to say because you know there's there there are I have so many problems with science journalism as it is. Um, I think that needs to be a lot better. But you know I think there's there's also less appreciation um, for the hard sciences, quote unquote. Um, also having replication problems. And if I if I had if I had known this was going to go there, I would have pulled up. Um, the source for this, but you know, there was, I'm going off the top of my head, but you know, there was an investigation yeah. into replication of medical research, I want to say, and around 70% of researchers were unable to reproduce results from, from previous publications. And, and I don't think that's a reason to despair. Um, I think it's, it's just the nature of being at the interface of what we know and what we don't know, you know, like inevitably you're going to make a mistake and that'll still get published out there. And that's fine because eventually uh, when further research needs to be built on that research, then the, the wheat will separate from the chaff and, and what works will, will be what is ever used in the future so like even even medicine and and physics and chemistry are are subject to uh difficulties in replication and and that's not really a problem like and we should also talk about it's this is we're talking about experimental replication right? yeah we can replicate other people's results by using their data and the same techniques and survey data all the time yeah. We can replicate other people's results by using the same data, the same techniques. But what we're talking about here is doing an experimental piece of work and then replicating that experiment. And that's different from other kinds of replicating other people's findings or taking a new data set and testing a theory that it produced a certain result and replicating those results. So the other thing, too, is replication often becomes like this homogenous thing when we replicate findings in lots of different ways, you know, in the, in the sciences. Mm hmm. 
Yeah. And experiment is particularly on the edge of knowledge. Yeah. And, and I think when, when, when you're at that interface, it's uh, difficult to say anything definitive and, and there is that human element to it. Um, and, and, and regarding that sort of putting out information that we haven't replicated yet. Um, and it may or may not be true. Like whenever I read a paper, I have to sort of be in the mindset of, okay, this might not actually have happened. Like, um, I, I more or less have to take, uh, the writer's word that this is what they did. These are the techniques they used, but I'm not mm -hmm. necessarily sure that this is what would happen if I were to do it the same day, you know? Um, and I, and I think I, I actually even made a video. It was one of my first videos. I, I just recently started this channel. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm putting out sort of like, uh, video essays centered around humanism and at some level, um, when you read a scientific paper, it's at, at some level, it's, it's just a claim. Like it's a claim about what we did is a claim about what results we did. And it's a claim that the peer reviewing, uh, the, the members of, of the scientific community that peer reviewed the paper found it to, you know, pass the smell test, these techniques hold water and stuff. And it, and it seems believable that, that, that these are the results they got. Um, at some level you, like nobody who's reading the paper actually was there for the experiment, did the experiment, got the data and results. So it, it is you, there is a, there is a human filter between the cold, hard data, quote unquote, and, uh, and the actual, what actually gets into your hand when you're reading it. And it, it, I, I think a lot of people would have a more healthy appreciation of science if things like that were recognized because the storytelling is necessarily part of the science. Yeah, and if I could just go back, sorry, to replication very quickly. Oh, yeah. Um, that's pretty much the, yeah, the project that I've been managing for, you know, what my work is um, we want to be able to have clarity in not only the data that people use to make their, to draw their conclusions, and there's a big push to publish the data with your findings or always provide a permanent link to where the data is stored when you publish your findings. Mm -hmm. What um, my project is, involved with is actually documenting the process when you transform variables or you harmonize over multiple countries or multiple time periods, the process you use, their thinking behind it, your decision making, and then actually the, the code that your statistical package used to run your data set. So in what we're going to be publishing starting in 2019 is documentation on all of the logic and the sources and whatever behind the harmonization and then the actual code that the researchers use to produce the data set that you're using. So if you wanted to take their data set from 10 years ago, say in 2029, um, and update the variable names or whatever else, you could run the exact same process on your data that they did to see if you could then run the same theories and whether or not things have changed over time. So that's the direction that we're moving in in order to improve replication. And then also that documentation becomes citable so that in the course of the article, you don't have to explain why you coded things the way you did. You publish it in the library or the harmonization hub that we're setting up. And then you just put the citation for it and the permanent link to your documentation. And then people can just go and get access it at any time. So that's what I do for a living. Are you still there? <laughs> Have I just been talking to myself for a while? Hello, people in the chat. This is awkward. <laughs> it's like he's left the call, but I'm still live, which is a, actually a good sign because it means that he's recognized that he's been locked out of the Hangout and will be joining us shortly. So while I have your attention, I might as well plug my channel. If you want to come over, you can check me out. Uh, you search Christy Winter's channel in YouTube. You'll come to my channel. Channel. My most recent video is a segment from a happy hour that I host with Kevin Logan about once a week or every 10 days. We get together and just talk about 
the nonsense that's happening in the world and also YouTube drama because we're low bro as well as high bro. And in the most recent episode, we went over a segment by Jordan B. Peterson where he is talking about feminists and radical Islamists um, and the, the, the people who shout for equality and egalitarianism are the ones who actually most want to be dominated by men. And I have a little segment from that that where we break that down and explain why it's full of crap. So hopefully you'll be rejoining the call here any moment or uh, I'll just be left here until it naturally cuts off. So uh, I'm going to be quiet for a few seconds here and try to go into Twitter and tell him to rejoin the Hangout with the original link and he can rejoin it that way. I'm typing. And spelling things wrong. <laughs> All right, not sure if he'll check his Twitter, but that message is off. Um, I'm not really else prepared to say too much else if I'm honest, everyone. So, um, uh, and now my thing is doing the thing where it doesn't want to. Uh, okay, now I'm back in the call. Have you ever tried to like switch those in a phone and then you can't get back to your Hangout? Probably not. I wouldn't imagine that enough people have done live Hangouts on their mobile phone to have this particular problem. But uh, what else can I say? This, um, let's see, we talked about ideas of narrative. Oh, one other idea I did want to bring up for this, now that I'm just talking to the audience live, <laughs> is, uh, I think I heard him join the call. Excellent. Okay. You're back. Yeah, I don't know uh, what happened. Internet, sorry. Um, but that's all right. I think you had just finished talking about um making your uh techniques in your code open source. Um or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I told everybody about that. So they all heard it and you can just listen back because it was long. I'm not gonna go over that again. I'm not gonna <laughs> no, waste everybody's time. <laughs> that's that's fine. But, I'm I'm glad that the internet crashed when that happened, so that's good. But uh, no, <laughs> no, I, I think my group has been been interested in that because my research group focuses a lot on programming and processing data, and I think recently we're trying to make our stuff more open source too. So uh, that's always interesting. And and we use open so open source software for some of the things we do anyway. So I, yeah. I think that's really important, especially when you're talking about replication and uh, and uh, trying to make it so everybody else gets the same data that you would. So it's good. Yeah, and, and our software that we provide is open source using all open source you know, stuff and it's up on GitHub. And um, we're trying to adapt to R, which is in Python, which are two oh, yeah. really exploding forms. Um, so yeah, actually the bid that we've put in, <laughs> you want to talk about nightmare experience with the funding body. Maybe I shouldn't say anything until after they make their final decision. But we're under consideration from a funding body to create a piece of software. So you know R or Python or both? I use, I know R. Okay. I, I learned it when in, taking stats. Okay. Well, in the social sciences, we also use SPSS data. There's also people who use SAS and M+. And currently, our software can create the code for recoding variables in those um, proprietary languages, not R or Python, but the four that you have to pay for. And our bid is um, a proposal that would, um, in about three years' time, provide a tool. We would gather the code languages from all of these um, six packages. We would create a master language using JSONs where mm -hmm. we would basically kind of create a spinal network of what, a, let's say, a recode command is in all six languages. And that universal language, it's kind of like a gold standard in converting from euros and dollars and pounds, right? Mm -hmm. You convert everything into gold and then every, you know what the value is of everything. That JSON would be like our gold standard. And then you could either look up the code to say, how do I say recode in Stata? 
or the final product would be like a Google Translate interface where you paste in the code of one, your language, and then you hit the buttons and it translates oh. it into the equivalent code in the other languages. That makes a lot of sense. And makes so much sense. And I'm pretty sure we're going to get funded for it because it's, and we've had, <laughs> I'll tell that, maybe I could just tell the story. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very niche piece of software, right? So there's not a lot of people in the world who could probably peer review it meaningfully. We submitted it to a funding body to one program and they contacted us and said, we actually think you're better suited to this other funding program. And we're like, okay, <laughs> that sounds like a good suggestion coming from the people who spend the money. So I restructured the bid a bit to meet the new format and I submitted so the, the original bid went in in August. I submitted the new one in September. And when we hadn't heard by the start of January, got in contact with them and they said, well, we had struggled to find reviewers. We could only, we couldn't, we normally take three. We could only find two. Um, so please contact us at the end of, you know, January, we'll have a decision. We contacted them at the start of February because we hadn't heard anything. And they said, okay, well, we decided to go ahead with the two reviewers because we couldn't find a third. So your, your funding proposal will be considered at the March meeting. Contact us uh, at the, uh, you know, the start of, or, you know, the end of March, or, or we'll contact you by the end of March with an answer. We contacted them at the start of April because we hadn't heard anything. <laughs> and they said, oh, you made it through the March meeting. Now you're on to the final meeting in April, which is the final select committee, which will decide whether or not you get funded. So we waited until the start of May because we didn't hear anything. And they said, during the course of the final consideration, it was brought up that one of your reviewers had some sort of connection to the institution that you work for and might have had a conflict of interest. So they threw out that review and we couldn't proceed with just one reviewer. So we're starting you over from the beginning again. Oh, no. That's and they hadn't even told us. They hadn't even told us they were putting us back into the pipeline, which again, OK, one, they have a history of really not getting back to us. but. The fact that they just sort of said, okay, just put it through again, as opposed to asking us to reapply again. And the fact that they, they, they said, hey, we think you're a better fit over here. I think it's, it's it makes sense. Everyone I describe this program to says that would be amazing. And so I think that they see the benefit of having their logo on that product. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like when they go to the government and say, what have you done to help t uh, expand science? They're like, look at this thing. <laughs> um, and so I have a good feeling about it. I think it'll get funded, but it's just, it's been, uh, it's been this just weight on my shoulders and it uh -huh. should have taken four months. You know, we uh -huh. were told four months from last, last August. Well, I, so that's I, my <laughs> good, good luck with that one. At least I, I, I wish you the best <laughs> for that funding source. That's, that's, Thank you. yeah, I think, yeah. Um, so, uh, I, I thought of something else that I thought I'd run by you, and this might actually tie into social justice, which, you know, we're both both nerds interested in advocating for that, so that's that's a good thing. Um, I think a lot of um, let me let me go from the social justice angle. Um, I think a huge part of making change at this point is representation. Like um, just making it be known that, you know, there are, you know, um, there are uh, workers who are women and workers of color. And like, we can tie it into science. There are, you know, women of color in science, uh, things like that. There are trans people in science. Um, and I think a lot of visibility and humanizing how like those identities are actually part of everyday life and that is their everyday life. I think that's a huge part of creating change and there's not as much appreciation for it. A lot of people are focused on, well, this is wrong. This is, this is like focusing on the arguments and, and, and the dialogue. And, and I think just making that visibility happen might, might actually drastically change how people behave. And, and my perception of, of the social science within, within that seems to align with that. But also, I think um, other science about whether people 
accept scientific findings has to do with how much people trust um, the uh, trust the uh, researcher or trust the person giving them that information. And I think both of those intersect in that there needs to be more humanizing of the people putting in the work and the and the humanizing of the people who are uh, looking for um, uh, looking for people to to get on board with these ideas, be they scientific or social ideas, and 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 I think so. Science communication has caught on to this. I think there are, there's more storytelling and there's there's more of this. Um, you know, present presenting science not in a dry, factual way, but in a more uh, human way. And I, and I'm wondering if anything I'm I'm saying makes sense to you. That like there needs to be more humanization of of all these things to make progress and and get more of of you know social norms on board with these things. I would say that if you ask people for their image of a scientist, it would be a old white guy in a lab coat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and representation is a way of expanding our concept of what a scientist is. Mm -hmm. And that human connection, I think, is part of it. Uh, you know, one of the, the benefits of that lab coat is it is associated with authority. Mm -hmm. So it, um, it's a way of communication, the way of communicating from a person in a position of power to people who should take on board what is being said. Um, and, you know, is that really how we want to treat science? Or do we want to treat it like other forms of knowledge? You don't see philosophers sitting in lab coats making pronouncements or, mm -hmm. you know, other people. It, but Well, it philosophy also has a white male problem, too. Like a huge problem. Right, that. but not a lab coat. Oh, yeah, right. yeah definitely with the... Um, the form of uh, what is a body of that type and old mm -hmm. white the dude is definitely <laughs> the, in philosophy but i was thinking in this case i should have been more clear the, the representation of the authority of the lab coat and making science more human i think also makes the scientific process seem more human as opposed to from a you know a a priest wears a black and a dog collar you know the collar around their neck and a police officer wears a certain kind of uniform and we are deferential to the police a lab coat is a form of authority and you know that's a question of you know what sorts of signals of authority do we want to associate with tentative scientists scientific claims maybe mm -hmm. take off the lab coat yeah no that that makes sense and you know I, i'm just thinking of you know there's a perception of elitism among scientists and that definitely ties into it but you know when you when you have a huge contingent in the United States where uh, global warming, for example, is is seen as like, I don't know, it's it's untrustworthy, it's elitist, it's a tax grab uh, to get more money into the government, um, things like that. I, I'm, I'm not sure exactly, but like, I don't think a lot of... Um, people who don't accept global warming, I don't think they know very many scientists or they may not just have anyone with that sort of connection that they can trust. But maybe, you know, you have a TED talk where you get, I don't know, a, a, a Southerner on stage that somebody can relate to, like, you know, maybe a mm -hmm. graduate student um, with a, a deep Southern accent, um, but ended up working in climate science, that's one of their people and they can relate to that. And, and they can trust that that person isn't just some shill for big government or whatever. Right. And that's why you're saying representation is important because you, um, seeing yourself in someone else's experiences creates a level of connection, right? Mm -hmm. So the more people you have telling the stories of science the more opportunities you have to make connections and you know i remember seeing a guy speak about being a roman catholic and going through his deconversion process and you know i related a lot more to process than a woman who was a mormon describing the same thing right so mm -hmm. it's not just about descriptive demographics it's about a, a range of life experiences and and that means yeah you need you can't just have a whole bunch of the same people with experiences if you want to connect more broadly. 
Yeah, and I, I think, you know, there's there's maybe it's an elitist attitude, I'm not sure, among skeptics, but I think there's an attitude that we want to convince people for the for the right reasons like we want to go up to every single person in the country and say oh these are the techniques we use to prove global warming or this is why global warming is true and 97 percent of scientists believe global warming is true um but i don't think most people think that way for most things like we we as social species just sort of get on board with our surroundings so i think uh producing that more human environment about accepting those things as a social norm like i think that's ultimately a good thing even even if you know people might not be on for the right reasons um <laughs> it'll help us you know it, it'll help prevent uh the climate from from increasing in temperature or something like that you know yeah and there's also the fact that um you know, you can use, you can cite scientific information. Um, it's kind of like the is ought problem, right? You know, you want to say, uh, let's say, you know, people see male and female in, in nature, therefore male and female in the social category is what is right and proper. Um, or in, in the, um, sorry, I kind of lost my train of thought here, but let me go back. Uh, when we have science being cited for, let's say, moral arguments. There are better, there are not better, but there are other reasons to engage environmental protection than just mm -hmm. climate change. You know, there's a whole bunch of like immediate health benefits and also aesthetic issues and uh, the thought of conservation for the future. What are our long-term plans? Um, can we really just keep dumping all this carbon uh, dioxide and monoxide and everything into the atmosphere and, and think it's never going to affect us um, mm -hmm. And you can use science in those um, arguments, but that doesn't mean just because you're citing science, somehow all the, you know, nobody can sort of, it's, you're the king of the hill. No one can touch you. And when you're talking to people who, who deny climate science, I think there's a deeper emotional resistance to policies of climate change that I think have to do with them not wanting to change how they live. Mm -hmm. Um, and not wanting to have to use um, the, the, the new light bulbs instead of the old light bulbs that took up more energy and not wanting to have to get a smaller car or a lighter car. Um, it, uh, having to pay a tax when they go on an airplane for the carbon tax. Right? They don't want to have all of these inconveniences. And, the, and rather than say that, they object to the science that is the basis for the policies. And mm -hmm. so it's a deflection issue really i think more than a debate about science right and, and yeah i think i think most people don't um they don't rely on the hard data for pretty much anything or at least most things in their daily lives and so th that doesn't seem much different so i i don't know i i, I think you know i think there are other ways of I think there are other ways of combating climate change other than just carbon taxing and things like that. I think developing, you know, renewables, switching to nuclear can certainly help. But like at, at, at that same basis, uh, at that same base level, they're just rejecting uh, the the mere concept of climate change completely. And uh, that's that's very frustrating when when it's 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 almost a cultural norm, maybe in the South. To say, oh, those those liberals are just uh, coming up with uh, chicken and the egg sky is falling, uh, like everything's just falling to pot. So now we need to tax people, and that'll solve everything because liberals just want big government. They have their narrative, and I think um, you know, just giving, uh, putting out more people that that align with their culture but don't align with that narrative might actually help but i don't know I, i'm i'm sure they'll attribute the more intense and frequent hurricane damage that we've seen is is the sign that the apocalypse is coming not oh yeah that. they have their other <laughs> narrative yeah no but you know with religion too um that's the case with religion the more the more uh 
let's say atheists you see, then the more likely somebody is to reconsider, oh, maybe that's a viable position rather than it, 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 it may not be the logical reason somebody's an atheist, but it, it, it gets the process going to like why they're thinking about those things once they see that visibility. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. And on the other end of the spectrum, I think representation is oh. important. That's that's all. I'm just gonna yeah. cap that. Right. Okay. Yes, and I agree. I definitely agree. Uh, not only that, because uh, because people who come from different backgrounds might ask different questions mm -hmm. that people who were who came before them who without those backgrounds wouldn't have thought to ask. That's mm -hmm. just a benefit of of having a diverse talent pool. Is, is you know you have a uh, um, more opportunities for new ideas, and mm -hmm. not only maybe the ideas themselves don't end up coming out, but they might spark someone else to have an idea that improves something else. Right? So that that cauldron, um, it, the the more diversity there is, the more potential there is for interaction and development. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, well, I I believe in meritocracy and not quotas. So so boo on you. I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> Oh, I was going to say, though, on the opposite end of the spectrum of the people who say, oh, you know, we measure man, woman in, in biology, therefore there are only two categories in social life, not really taking the step back and saying, oh, well, scientists who were observing the world and treating this, they weren't always looking at um, intersex or considering other things or hadn't had experience with the third gender in mm -hmm. India. And so they use this heuristic that covers, you know, 95, 94 percent of the observations. It's, it's close enough to be a model right of the world yeah. and saying that 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 measurement that it, we know is imprecise somehow is the base for creating a very precise division in the social world which has always been negotiating masculine feminine maleness femaleness what it means to what those roles are um, what the aesthetics are everything else so um yeah that that's the other side of the scientism uh, is it will create a climate change denialists who use the science incorrectly right? um, and then people who use science and give it an authority that it really doesn't have in order to stop a discussion about social constructs in a yeah. society you know negotiated things yeah. like that yeah that it, it's a kind of reductionism that doesn't really help the discourse whatsoever and and i'm really i i always laugh with that because actually there's somebody in my department who's trans non-binary who does biological research. So I, I just find that hilarious. So um, cool. We, we are at an hour. Was there anything else yeah. that, that he, um, you might have thought of bringing up, but we never really got to um, in this discussion? Honestly, I, I talked about more than I planned because I had to sort of uh, vamp for about four minutes there. So no, I'm, I'm well and truly feel uh, talked out on this. No, That's I mean we cool. could talk about it later, but I felt like we had a good discussion here. Absolutely, and and I I, I think you you validated me, so uh, that's a problem, but that's that's okay. You've also corrected me on some things, which is good. Um, cool. So uh, you're on my channel. I'd be surprised if most of the people uh, know me but don't know who you are. But do you do you want to give out your information? Uh, before we go? Well, I um, already did that as part oh, of my okay. vamp. So since I'm going to be mirroring this on this channel, why don't you shout out your channel <laughs> for my viewers? Okay. Well, uh, I'm I'm Jeremiah. Uh, my channel on YouTube's Jerb the Humanist. Uh, I don't want to go by that title. That's just the channel name, but I'm focusing on centering YouTube comment on uh, content on humanism. So I'm, I am talking about science and social justice things and philosophy and i'm really trying to target you know edge lords and center lords and stem lords and actually communicate with them good luck with that i know but um i think regarding that representation thing i i, I do see it as a responsibility for myself who is um engaged in social justice circles um, um, but also, you know, fits the nerdy white dude, uh, check boxes. Like I, I feel it's a responsibility to sort of act as a role model for how I think, um, white men should behave. 
<laughs> so um, we'll see how that goes, but I'm just starting it up. I, I started at the end of May. I have uh, video essays. I've been doing some live streams like this one. Uh, hopefully some people find it interesting. So, and, and thanks for, uh, thanks for the signal boost, Christy. I, I appreciate it a lot. And, and I'd love, yeah, I'd well, love this discussion about science. Yeah. Yeah. This has been very enjoyable. I'm glad we did this as opposed mm -hmm. to just trying to go back and forth on Twitter. Absolutely. Sounds good. Yeah. Any, anything else before we go? Um, how many viewers did we have? Uh, I think we way? only, I think we only had, I think we maxed out at three. So, uh, <laughs> all right. So yeah. I have to beat three. Okay. We'll be in a race. No, I'll see how many subs we can get you. I'll see. I'll, I'll push your channel and see what we can get uh, okay. as soon as possible. No. Thank you. And uh, I think the next video I want to make is actually on intersectionality. So hard oh, social cool. justice stuff. So we'll see how that right. goes. But uh, uh, thank you All so right. much. So people should sub. So people should sub your channel now so that they can definitely catch that when you publish it. All right. Yeah. From one of my mirror. <laughs> okay. I'll get you the mirror soon. But uh, thank you so much, Christy. Thank you.